Welcome to What the F is Going On in Latin America, Code Pink's weekly YouTube program of hot news out of Latin America and the Caribbean. In partnership with Friends of Latin America and Task Force on the Americas, we broadcast every Wednesday, 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern on Code Pink YouTube. On September 7, El Salvador became the first country to adopt Bitcoin as legal tender, allowing the cryptocurrency to be used in any transaction from buying a cup of coffee to paying taxes. The bold move largely celebrated by the international Bitcoin community has found a more skeptical reception at home and in the, tra and in the traditional financial world, amid concerns that it could bring instability and unnecessary risk to the Central American country's fragile economy. President Nayib Bukele has promoted the digital currency's adoption pitching it as a way of bringing more Salvadorans, about 70% of whom don't have banking accounts, into the formal economy. Using the cryptocurrency would make it faster and cheaper to get remittances from abroad, he argues, and could free the indebted nation from the hold of the traditional global financial system. In El Salvador, many are viewing the move with confusion and distrust, afraid that the volatility inherent to using virtual tokens with no physical backing, which is like not unlike the US dollar, I would say, uh, which are apt to soar and crash in value. This could be dangerous for the economy and people's individual savings. El Salvador's moves puts it at the forefront of a revolution in finance on the blockchain, where a parallel universe of crypto-based alternative banking services is booming and eliciting alarm from officials in Washington and beyond. To talk more about this global first, we are joined by Yesenia Portillo of CISPES, the Committee in Solidarity with the People of El Salvador. Welcome, Yesenia. Hi, Terry. Thank you for having me. Oh, so wonderful you could join us. Really, I'm so delighted that you could talk to us today right on the heels of, of Tuesday's announcement. And it's pretty, um, it's, a, it's a pretty big story for a small country to be the first to do this. Can you um, give us a little bit of background as to how this decision came about? Yeah, so I think that's one of the most troubling um, about all of about all of this is that um, it was very sudden. Uh, there was no consultation um, with um, civil society about this at all. Um, so if if we if we know a little bit about what's going on in El Salvador right now, um, because of the legislative elections that happened in February. Um, uh, President Nayib Bukele was able to secure a legislative assembly that is beholden to him um, and does everything that his regime asks of them. Um, they have a supermajority. His party, um, the New Ideas Party, holds a, a historic supermajority over the legislative assembly, along with a, a very small handful of, of allied um, of an allied party, Ghana, which is the party he ran for presidency. So they they control the legislator and they're able to pass legislation without discussion or debate. Um, and this is what happened um, with the Bitcoin announcement. It was basically the first time I think Salvadorans really heard about, or anybody really heard about this was at some cryptocurrency convention <laughs> that happened um, that um, Jack Mahler's, I believe is his name, who was slated to um, provide the Bitcoin wallet strike um, where Salvadorans would be able to cha um, change the Bitcoin into dollar. Um, anyways, he was the first person to basically announce that he was in conversations with the president of El Salvador. This is a conference happening in English. And, you know, it was in Miami, I believe, coincidence, and <laughs> probably not coincidentally Miami. <laughs> So a couple of days after that, you know, is when the Bitcoin law was presented by the executive and passed very quickly after that in the middle of the night um, by um, the Salvadoran Legislative Assembly, um, by the Nueva Ideas Salvadoran Legislative Assembly. Yeah, so that's that's kind of the background of, of the rollout. There's more we could get into, but I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that. Let's talk a little bit um, about how the Salvadoran people are responding to this. This, um, I mean, the president touted this 
or I guess we maybe said made it palatable to um, Salvadoran citizens because uh, he is saying it can facilitate receiving remittances from abroad, which is a pretty big selling point to people. But how, how realistic is this for the majority of Salvadoran citizens? How many people or what percentage of, of the population actually has um, devices, has, has the, the access to the devices? I think it's a, um, a wallet, an electronic wallet that you have to use. Yeah. And so that's gonna require some sort of electronic device and an electronic device is gonna require uh, access to the internet. So Wi-Fi, cellular data, how realistic is the technology for the majority of people? So, um, you know, I think at this point, most people have cell phones and have smartphones. The problem is internet connection and um, like data. Uh, so a lot of people that are living in extreme poverty or poverty do not have um, like, unlimited access to internet. It's usually very limited access to the internet. And um, a lot of, uh, in the rural communities, um, the connection isn't very strong. So folks have to like go to another person's house or to a hill in order to tap into um, data. Um, so that's, I guess, accessibility is, is that um, with regards to like how it's being received by the population also. So you know, it was announced about three months ago. Um, and when when the when the Salvadoran Legislative Assembly passes legislation, it has three months um, to kind of be hashed out where people can, legislators can um, submit reforms, etc. cetera. Um, I don't think that any reforms were really made. Um, there were reforms presented. Like, for example, one of the major things about the way the legislation is written is that um, Salvadorans will be required to receive payment in Bitcoin um, if somebody wants to pay in Bitcoin. Um, so one of the reforms that was being that has been proposed by FMLN legislators was to to change that and to get that out of the out of the law. And this is why um, you know it, it's a little bit kind of convoluted. But the way the idea with um, Bitcoin in El Salvador and, and the problem too is that the information, um, the specifics, the details were not have not been um, very well communicated to the to the people of El Salvador. So we have um, tech experts from civil society, um, e economists from civil society, doing all the public education that the executive should be doing, because there is no transparency. The legislators themselves don't even know what the law means or what it, how any of it is really gonna function. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what these three months have been, has been so the Salvadoran people kind of learning about what this all means through um, educating themselves, um, through um, folks, you know, uh, activists, tech, tech experts, econom economists that are kind of filling in the gaps um, with whatever information they do have because of course, the, the, the government hasn't provided all of the details about how things are being financed, et cetera. I mean, and that's an, another major point that we can get to is um, how the infrastructure for this is where the money is coming from for the infrastructure for this and getting Salvadorans to actually buy into it because it, it's, it's, it's not as easy just to say, you know, so, you know, big, El Salvador is going to become the first country to accept Bitcoin as a legal tender. Like you can say that there's all these things that have to go behind that. You know, Bitcoin is not, um, a, you know, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin is something that is very, very confusing to the masses. And when you have a population that's um, used to uh, buying and selling things in cash, you have informal vendors that live off of um, $5 a day with what they can sell on the street that day in order to feed their family, cryptocurrency just doesn't make sense to that, to those populations, but they're gonna be required to accept Bitcoin as payment supposedly. Um, and, and as far as the remittances go, so because of the kind of dynamic that I just mentioned, the idea is that um, 
there's going to be a wallet that changes Bitcoin into dollars, right? So that's the strike wallet that I was mentioning, which has gotten replaced with um, a state run wallet. Um, and they, it's called Chivo wallet. So that was announced sometime after. Um, and so, you know, where the money is coming from is, you know, that they're investing like, you know, almost a quarter billion dollars in setting up the infrastructure for this cheap, like state run wallet that's going to supposedly transfer Bitcoin into dollars. So, so if you download this wallet and somebody wants to pay you in Bitcoin, you can receive it and then supposedly automatically turn it into dollars and then go to an ATM, a Chivo ATM, um, a state run ATM, and then get the dollars. Um, so then there's like different, there's many different kind of players that have to go into all of these things, right? Into the different transactions. Um, and so that there's, as far as I understand, in order to send a remittance um you still have to go through third parties it's not like you're just sending someone a bitcoin and they're going to go use a bitcoin on the street you know and all of this all of this costs money you know and there's no analysis about what this is costing the taxpayer to set up this infrastructure and um how much each salvadoran is paying for that thing for this for this infrastructure Plus the fees that, because there are fees that are yeah, that are charged as well. The idea that you know Wells Fargo and Watch Washington Mutual or whoever the the you know the remittances that are getting sent, they were completely exaggerating about how much people, how much you know the percentage of money that gets lost through the banks. The numbers that they were saying were just like not factual, um, and so so yeah, the the kind of benefit that they were giving in relation to remittances is just not clear. Well, it, you know, we all want to believe that cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin is so simple <laughs> and takes out the middle person, you know, the whole blockchain technology. And you're just listening to this description. It sounds, you know, as complicated as, as using a credit card, if not more so. <laughs> I mean, and this is this this is the thing that I'm that I was saying about it, and this is what tech activists and tech experts in El Salvador are saying. They're not against cryptocurrency; um, they're against the way it's being implemented in El Salvador. And the way that it's being implemented in El Salvador is really goes like kind of flies in the face of what it stands for, you know? Because now you have mm -hmm. a, a national government who's corrupt, has been stealing the money of the people. And is, you know, the, the intentions are not to, to actually provide liberation for the Salvadoran people. It's to line their pockets with this. Um, and so the, there, there's, there's going to be, um, they're now going to have to control this wallet and Bitcoin goes through there. So people are having to give a lot of information about their money through there anyways. Um, yeah. It seems very contradictory because it, the cryptocurrency is supposed to be a system independent of central control. And yet the system being introduced in El Salvador is definitely government introduced and government managed at the very least on a certain level, which seems totally contradictory to what the you know, invention of cryptocurrency and the blockchain technology was about. Yeah, and then kind of, I mean, I don't know if the last thing I'll say about this, but like something else to say is that um, the, there's just no, the, because of the lack of transparency and the lack of information that's get, been, being given, um, and we can talk about the attacks on government transparency and why this is all, because this is all very contextual to, to Bukele's regime, right? Um, he is a dictator. This is, there's just no question about it anymore. And he's engaged in, there's just so many different things that his regime has done to, um, to attack um, government transparency laws. Um, and he is a, he, his government is one that lies to the population and doesn't provide them the information that they need for all kinds of things. And this is very true for 
um, the Bitcoin decision. So that idea that um, Bitcoin is gonna liberate El Salvador from the wrath of the US dollar, from the World Bank, from the IMF, there's just no evidence of that. He hasn't convinced the masses of that because he hasn't told them how. You know, um, the US government is still sending military equipment to um, Bukele in just the couple of days um, prior to, yeah, he, you know, they're still sending military equipment to, to El Salvador. He's still asking the World Bank to help him finance this infrastructure. Um, and, and yeah, we can get also to the point about the economic situation that El Salvador is in, you know? Um, so, so just, you know, the fact that he's doing this without convincing the masses, this is a highly, highly unpopular um, measure. This is one of the most unpopular things that Bukele has done since he's become president. I, I think like- He's done a number of unpopular things. <laughs> right, but, but yeah, this is one this of the is... things that the polls show the vast majority of Salvadorans don't want it. And they certainly don't want it to be mandatory for them to have to receive payment through Bitcoin, which is kind of essential to, the, to, to their project. So you mentioned the, the IMF and the World Bank and um, both institutions are considering um, a financial deal with El Salvador and They've now the country's adopted Bitcoin. And what you're hearing from Wall Street and international financial institutions is that this system now introduced by the Salvadoran government is open. And then I find this ironic that these international financial institutions are saying this, but is open to money laundering and other illicit financial activity. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we know that can be done regardless of a cryptocurrency or not. But it's interesting that that is how these international financial institutions are interpreting Bukele's move at this point. And what what do you, I mean, is that something that's potentially that true? That is a concern of, of the Salvadoran people. When you're dealing with a government that has attacked um, the institutions of um, government transparency um, in a very systematic way. Um, so in the previous two administrations, um, there was a law passed that's the um, law, Ley de Acceso a la Información Pública, the law of access to public information. Um, they set up a secretariat of government transparency within the executive and a, an autonomous um, institute for access to public information. And then of course the law itself um, uh, delineates what the different government institutions need to do in order to keep the government, to keep the population informed. And he systematically dismantled all of that. Um, um, when he first came to office, got rid of the uh, transparency secretariat um, and has, um, attack the, the Institute of Access to Public Information, um, taken out any of the magistrate, illegally removed magistrates who were trying to keep the Institute running and doing what it was supposed to be doing, um, have passed laws to reform um, the, um, the law, um, you know, have, sorry, has passed reforms to the law. So there's just all of these things. Um, and and there's, there's a lot of credible, um, information about his dealings with um, criminal networks and transnational criminal networks. And, um, and so, th yeah, that is a very real concern about um, what um, the Bukele administration's intentions are with this. Um, yeah. Let's, you know, there's, there's two things. <laughs> I think I want to because it's international criminal networks. I mean, you know, the country to the east, Honduras is run by a president whose brother was convicted of narco trafficking. And also, you know, one thing I'd, I, I'd like us to touch on, and you mentioned it to me in comments before um, we went to our broadcast, was the support uh, by the Venezuelan opposition for Bitcoin in El Salvador. And I think we should be clear with the audience, not the Venezuelan opposition in general, but a very specific 
faction of the Venezuelan opposition and that being um, the opposition segment of Leopoldo Lopez. Yeah, and I, and I don't know that it's like, I don't know that I would say a support of a section of the opposition. No, it's, it's more specific than that. So um, the Pukele administration's basically inner ring of his administration are Venezuelan opposition, right-wing Venezuelan opposition um, people who were working with Leopoldo Lopez. And this was reported on, I mean, this had been reported on for a while, but this specifically what came out yesterday um, from El Faro is that, um, as, you know, the specifics about their involvement with the Bitcoin law. And what, what El Faro is reporting is that um, Sarah, ha Sarah, Han, Sarah Han, I believe is her name. Um, and, and I can't remember her specific role with, with, with um, Leopoldo Lopez, but I think it had to do with um, public education um, and youth programs. Um, and so she's part of uh, Nayib Bukele's inner, inner, inner circle. And as the way El Faro has reported it, as um, some of the uh, minister, some of uh, Nayib Bukele's ministers have um, been kind of identified by the US State Department as um, corrupt actors on the Engels list, these right-wing opposition Venezuelans are gaining even more prominence within his official kind of um, executive structure. So within the education ministry as well is what, again, what was reported in El Faro. Um, but, but yeah, this is like not something that gets talked about very much. It was very odd to me. Um, and because it, it, it is something that El Faro has been reporting for a while is, is his, his, um, his, that the fact that, you know, these folks are very, very tied into his administration and they were from the beginning, you know, his campaign until now, actually it being at the head and leading the Bitcoin rollouts and everything having to do with, with Bitcoin and Bitcoin wallet. From the start of his presidency, or even before. Yeah, from yes, um, wow. there's there was news. There was it's been reported that he um, he had Venezuelan campaign advisors as well. Wow. So let's talk about Bukele's plan to stay in power. <laughs> now that now that now that he's there, now that he's created. It, a, a financial system unique to El Salvador and he's manipulated the judiciary and the legislature. What's, what's next? What do you see as next? For him? Well, so, you know, you know that <laughs> he's known to be, he's a populist. So this is kind of a well-known thing or a well-known belief that, you know, he's widely, widely loved by Salvadorans. Um, you know, they, they gave him the presidency in a landslide, and then they gave him the legislator, um, uh, and they gave him a, a supermajority within the legislator. And he, he hypes that number up and downplays the opposition. He says 3%. He calls his opposition the 3%, um, which is just not factual, right? But um, the, as, as his presidency has you know, gone on with um, attacks against the other branches of government, with political persecution, persecution of, of journalists, um, persecution of, of activists, um, persecution of ex-FMLN government officials. Um, recently, a major kind of very, very extremely troubling thing that happened recently was one of the, um, one of the tech activists who has been doing incredible work in terms of um, informing the public about Bitcoin and about the concerns that Bitcoin brings. I mean, and, and I, I, like I said, it's, it's kind of a group of economists and tech specialists who have been doing that work. One of the main critics, one of a, ma a major critic that's been on Salvador news channels, panels, active on the internet, the day after his, inter his interview with a Salvadoran news station aired, uh, the last one that he did, he was arrested. Um, he was arrested without cause. Um, he was with his mom 
and she was scared for him and she didn't she didn't let the cops take him without her in the vehicle and he was released after a few hours because of just the the amount of pressure that the government got to let him go you know um so those are just some examples of like the political persecution of of course we have um the five xfmln functionaries that are being held in pre-trial detention on um supposed charges of corruption um and very very likely um lacking the kind of evidence needed um to pr to pursue these these charges and um and then we also have uh, you know um the mass murder that happened the mass um shooting that happened in january against fmln fmln officials as well um and within and so those that's the political persecution piece but as far as like the discontent that's growing as well um folks are see people in el salvador are seeing are seeing this stuff happen they're also seeing um the the cost of living going up so um fuel prices are constantly increasing um and the cost of food is going up as well um and they're just people are just getting really fed up with him um the big like again the bitcoin law is just so highly unpopular so that's definitely not helping him um and so he needs to um uh, let ensure his control by other means and this we this is something that we could have guessed would happen like that this dynamic would occur and that he would need to take control over you know um the 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 judiciary the legislative assembly and the electoral um the electoral body in order to secure his 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 presidency because he's not going to win via popular election or, or at least his chances of of winning via popular election are becoming smaller and smaller and besides the fact that he's not allowed to run for a second term under the salvadoran constitution which is a major thing so there's two things you know um he's not he's not allowed to run um for for a second term and in order to reform something like that you know this legislator would have to pass that and then the next legislator would have to approve it which would be after the next election um and so we had last week um the five supreme court magistrates who he illegally the his legislator illegally um uh put in in office um because i don't know if i think you had alexis on here we've talked talking about this about yes for, us, for our audience and i can um, post that link in the program description for people to review but we have had this conversation with CISPIS earlier this year. Yeah, so I'm sorry, I'm kind of going on and on, but hopefully <laughs> folks are following here. But basically, um, when, um, again, when the legislator took over on May 1st, um, they immediately moved, removed um, the, five, the five top court magistrates, so the constitutional, it's like the Supreme Court magistrates, all five were illegally removed and replaced with their own magistrates. So you have the head of the judiciary completely controlled by um, the Bugale regime. And they also removed the attorney general and illegally replaced him as well. And so, you know, their terms weren't up and um, they, they were removed because they, they had been making decisions and carrying out investigations against the administration. And so this, these illegally appointed Supreme Court magistrates on um when was it september 3rd i believe um they uh they made a decision or they put out a ruling that um the president that the that the electoral body needed to change the rules basically to permit the president to run for a second term um so and that is against the this constitution it's not unlike the country next door how they got their president yeah. Yeah. right Right. And I mean, and we have, we know that there's, we're talking about this too, right? As we Espinal and Raul are political prisoners that are still in prison out of the 17, I believe, that were arrested in the aftermath of, um, of that, of that, um, I, I believe it was the election, right? Yes. Of Juan Orlando Hernandez. Yeah. Right. Which yeah. he was able to run it was a fraudulent election in the same way that he was able to run 
because of of a change you know it, it was unconstitutional right for yeah. him to run again um so they changed the constitution <laughs> So he changed the constitution. In this situation, there's been no change to the constitution. Not yet. The, the, the constitutional judges are just saying that he can do it, even though it's against the constitution. Wow. So El Salvador is looking at a government, a president, a, a president specifically who controls the executive, the judiciary, the legislature, and, and now the monetary system. Well, Maybe, I mean, it's a to that's his total wanting, wanting like that sounds like the where he's that that sounds like his goal, right? Um, yeah. So that's the problem, right? So he's not liberating anybody. <laughs> like he just wants yeah. to control it for himself. Um, so all of us excited about cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, you know, need to take a second look at what he's doing. <laughs> yes, definitely, it is a wow. very dangerous. We need to look at the context here, you know. Um, this is not a, per, you know, he's not a socialist, even though he tries to talk like one sometimes. Um, and the other, he also controls the military and the police, you know, and that's yeah. another major, another major, major element there. And the U.S. keeps sending him money for that and equipment for that. Wow. It's, it's actually overwhelming. It really and is. it's, it, I mean, it's, a, it's huge. And, um, and as you and I said, when we first discussed doing this episode, it's, it's huge. And we talk so little about it. So I hope that you will, you know, keep us surprised and we can do additional episodes and watch how this all unfolds. And the reason support, I support, you know, and Terry, like also, so we need to, you know, be very vigilant and listen to what people in El Salvador are saying yes. about him because the arrogance, yeah. the arrogance that I'm hearing from people in the crypto community, you know, Salvadorans are not stupid and they're not talking about the tech itself. They're talking about their context and their reality, you mm -hmm. know, and, and the crypto community is being very myopic. Um, and it's very, very troubling. Um, they're supporting they're supporting a fascist dictator in order to carry out their view of the world. Um, and so it's very colonial and it's very imperialist. And Salvadorans have lived through this before. And it's not it's not okay. People really need to listen to what people on the ground are saying. The ma the majority of Salvadorans don't accept this. It wasn't there was he passed it overnight without any consultation and without any transparency. So it's very, it's very, very, it's very gross to me that people are acting like they know better, you know, than people on well, the Well, that's that whole colonial thing, right? <laughs> regardless, regardless of the language you speak or the color of your skin or your family heritage, that it's still that paradigm. Yeah. That you know that your system's best, that you know what's best for a people in their country. And I totally agree with you. It, it's so important to listen to what the Salvadoran people want. And like you said, the context in which um, they're living in and the political environment that they're currently functioning in. You know, before, um, before I let you go, because I really want you to come back, because there's two, two things that um, I want to share with our audience. And I, and I shared them with you before we, we started broadcasting. That this, when I started promoting our episode this evening, I immediately um, started getting comments on social media and different messaging um, apps. And it was, it was fascinating. I got uh, responses from Puerto Rico, uh, comments not unlike what you have shared with the audience today, as far as it's, it's a form of fascism, it's a form of authoritarian, it's um, it's a form of colonialism, taking control of the economy through a cryptocurrency. Um, and, I, and then contrary to that, we got pre-broadcast comments from people who do a lot of anti-sanctions work in Iran, Cuba, Venezuela, specifically those three countries saying cryptocurrency could, could not definitively, but could be the answer for those countries to get off the US dollar, to not have to deal with the overnight swift banking system. And those are all the, the dollar and the 
um, SWIFT system are tools that the U.S. controls, and because the U.S. controls them, they can, you know, use use sanctions, prohibit countries from interfacing um, with the dollar and with the bank, international banking system. So it's really um, it's fascinating because literally, as I shared with you, you know, there's there's two very strong camps, and then you have all the the, the tech people who have developed the. Um, blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies who, you know, who tend to, I would agree with your, your comment and with those from Puerto Rico that they're, they're basically, uh, you know, another, a new modern form of colonialism, the people supporting this. Yeah. I mean, I think if it's, I don't like, I think, I think we address kind of that at this point right in yeah. the sense of like it's really important to look at the context and how this is being used by the Bukele administration a fascist dictatorship um or becoming one very very quickly if not one already that has no accountability to its people so this is not something that's going to be in the hands of Salvadorans um and uh had deep connections and ties with the Trump administration, um, continues to receive military um, equipment from the US government, um, is asking the World Bank to help him finance this stuff. So the, the idea that he's some sort of liberator of the Salvadoran people just, just, just doesn't make any sense. Um, so yeah, I think that that's it. And, uh, and I was just gonna kind of also add um, in the sense of like, yes, listening to the Salvadoran people and what is happening right now is folks are taking to the streets more and more and more. Um, and so we did have um, uh, several marches that were called um, this, this past yesterday um, uh, in the capital. So we had uh, a few, you know, a couple thousand people taking to the streets for this, which is pretty remarkable because you know, the Bukele administration has been so widely popular so far, but this is just not, this is not a popular, this is not something that the people want. So um, let's have you come back. Let's follow this story and see the ramifications of it. And I'm also really, um, it'll be really important to watch how Bukele um, stays in power if, 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 he's able to finagle that and to follow the, and to follow the Salvadoran people, as you, you know, um, yesterday, you mentioned they were in the street. Yesterday was the day that was September 7th was the day this Bitcoin, um, project was announced. And so that's, so there was an immediate negative response, which is. Yeah. I mean, and to... they've been, they've been taking to the streets. So all last week as well, um, it started off before the before the Supreme Court, the illegally appointed Supreme Court magistrates passed that ruling that he can run again for president, even though it's, that's an unconstitutional ruling, um, a few days before that, the legislator um, also overstepped its own mandate and um, changed uh, the age limit for which judges can sit. And so they said any judge over 60 has to, is immediately expelled. So they expelled about 200 judges oh, um, no. earlier last week. So legislators, you have all the branches of government doing just any, you know, just doing his bidding. Um, and so the, some of those magistrates that he, some of those judges that he, that the legislator removed because they're over 60 are judges that are in charge of very important cases and that um, that he's attacked, he's been attacking. Um, so one of them being the judge that's overseeing the El Mosote massacre case that has ruled that the government needs to open the archives, for example. And another part of that um, reform that the legislator passed um, was that the legislative assembly can like shift judges around to different um, munis municipalities. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's a very dangerous situation and it, it is really important to demand for the U.S. government to stop sending military equipment to, um, Nayib Bukele and to stop, you know, imposing, um, 
neoliberal extractivist policy um, and, and, and it's a regional issue as well. So yeah. um, CSPES has a campaign, um, it's N, hashtag and harmful aid to Central America. Um, and you can go to cspes.org to slash take action um, to con contact congressional representatives and call for um, uh, no US financing to these harmful, um, um, yeah, these, this harmful kind of aid that goes to Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador specifically that the Biden administration is pushing. Wow. So there's so, there's so much. I wish we could just keep talking and I want to have you come back so we can follow all of this. I think um, so people can find you at CISPES, C -I -S -P -E -S .org, and org, the, and the action they can take again is? It's at cspes.org slash forward slash take action. Take action. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Yosinia, for this terrific conversation. And um, I really hope our audience has a, has a different perspective now on um, the headlines across the world are almost, you know, are so exciting. First, you know, national implementation of cryptocurrency, and there's a lot of excitement about it. And, and I really appreciate you joining us today to take some of that gloss off uh, what, of the preconception of what a cryptocurrency is and how it's, and how it's being used um, in Thank El Salvador. Thank you, Terry. No, oh, thank you. I'm so thankful to talk with you again and so happy to see you. And I want to remind our audience that you've been watching What the F is Going On in Latin America. We broadcast every Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern, 4.30 p.m. Pacific on Code Pink YouTube. And also, please be sure to tune in to Code Pink Radio. Code Pink Radio broadcasts every Thursday morning, 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific on WBAI out of New York City, simulcasting on WPFW out of Washington, D.C. Okay, everyone, thank you so much. Really appreciate you joining us. Thank you again, Yusinia, and I look forward to a follow-up conversation. Awesome. Thank you, Terry. Have a good day.